Okay, well, this is going to be our final talk, and this one's a lot of fun. This is, of course, all going to be about the barns that were here. And uh, unfortunately, we don't know very much about them. When we had our first discussion with Phineas Banning, we were able to kind of trace back who had actually been studying him, where all of our research comes from, and how we've come to the conclusions that we have today. And it's the same thing with last two weeks ago, our lecture with regards to the historic structures report and the construction of the house. Because with that document, we really pretty much know how the house, what the house is made of. Uh, we still have some unanswered questions on timeline and things of that nature. But we know a lot more about the house than we did prior to even having that wonderful document. But with the barn, we don't have any, uh, any of the benefits of past research that help us understand what this wonderful structure is all about. Now, there was, back in 1984, a short little report made about the barn. And this really doesn't go into the history of it. It goes into more along the lines, and this is in our library, but this goes more along the lines of what can we do with the barn? And so this was Friends uh, research into potential of what are we going to do with this structure? And this is one of the very first attempts that Friends has made into, I shouldn't say restore, but we're going to use the word interpret the barn. So they kind of lay out what can happen in here. And this was really the start of transforming the barn, dealing with the carriages that we had, and how we're going to move forward with everything that's in here. Um, there's the, the fun thing about this is there's some great pictures that we had no idea even existed, which are fabulous, but they're in here. So please take a look at it. And we found out that they're from the Huntington Library. And thanks to Mrs. Call and her connections there, we were able to get copies of all of those. So um, not a big help, but it got us started. So today what we're going to do is understand a little bit about why the barns are here and what they were used for. So to begin with that idea, let's talk about our very first slide here. This is a land survey showing the house, believe it or not. Now, this doesn't show all of the acreage, of course. I've had to crop this. If you look at the, the wonderful map that is above the desk in the general's office, that was one of the very first commissioned land surveys of the township. And it actually shows the property here. If you look really close, you'll see actually where Drum Barracks is on that map and then where the house is on that map. And there are two 111 acre parcels that are side by side. So we're pretty close out front. I think we would probably go down to about what we know today as L Street and then all the way back about 111 acres back that way. So it went actually very farther back than we, than we realized that we have. You know, today we're just about 20 acres in the park. So you can imagine 222. It was a huge, huge place. So just to get you familiar with this, and I, this is probably M Street today, right here. This is the house. This is our one room schoolhouse or the cream house. This building, we don't know what it is. This is the well, which is underneath the pump house, the little building that's kind of doing the dismantling on its own. <laughs> that's it. Now, behind the well, this structure here is the reservoir that was made. And there's a wonderful picture of that inside the visitor center on the timeline of photos of family occupancy. And it's down next to the fireplace. Take a look at that. You can actually see how big this cement reservoir was. And this was actually a very significant structure in its day because that was the first cement reservoir 
in Los Angeles, in Los Angeles County. And it's wonderful accounts of it in the newspaper about how Banning is going to transform the harbor area with his collection of water. So another great newspaper account for us. So with that, the house, the barn that we're in today. Now there's a little, you can see it right out the window. There is a little stucco structure. And we also see it in photographs that's right outside our rose garden in between the fence. And that little building was used as a gardening shed, we think. Behind that are two other structures. We don't know what they are. We can see them in one photo, and I'll point that out. And then a very long single story, and they're calling it a barn in the picture, and it's a single story stable. And this goes pretty much from behind here, because if we're out in our parking lot, the corner of the parking lot, basically through the rose garden, and then all the way out that way, this was a very long stable. And then when we look at the accounts that he has in the ledger books in his inventory at the Huntington Library, he's dealing with an enormous amount of livestock. And when we're talking about livestock, of course, these are going to be the mules and the draft horses that he uses, of course, for freighting and staging. So it's apparent that he's got a lot of what he's using for his business here on the property. And these aren't all in Wilmington. These are here. So a lot of his, I don't know if he's bringing them back and forth or if he's hooking up things here. That portion of it isn't really clear, but he has the ability to have all of these animals here. And in one of the accounts at the Huntington Library, it makes mention that he has 300 head of mule. Now, I don't know if they're all here or if they're part of that's in Wilmington or if he rotates them and brings them back and forth. That's a lot of stock. And that is a tremendous amount of feed when you've got to feed them a couple of times a day. Plus with 300, that's, that's 1,200 horseshoes. So he's got to have people here that can shoe. He's got to have farriers, which is that person's job, blacksmiths. He's also got to have the ability to feed them and we do know in the newspapers that he is growing wheat, grain, and barley. So when we start looking at this, we can really see this isn't just one home and a barn. It's an operation. You know, this actually makes his business operate. So behind our barn, the single story, long barn, and then a smaller outbuilding, and then another building back here, that is labeled stable. So there is another barn behind this one that says stable. However, we know through photographs that this is kind of late, this, this observation here, this, this diagram, for two reasons. We know that there were three barns exactly of this dimension, and we have pictures that show that that were all in a line, this being barn one, then two, and then three. We also know that the reservoir doesn't come in until the early 1880s. So this is really kind of showing the property, not in its heyday, pardon the pun, but in its day of, you can see where he's transitioning from freighting and staging to railroad and not having the need for all of the equipment and the personnel here to be able to maintain all that stock. So without having him running his freight wagons and his stagecoaches, things are starting to kind of dismantle and become less the way they would have been had we seen this <coughs> diagram in the 1860s when the house was first built and into the early 1870s. So. The other thing to point out is the cemetery is off to the corner here. And this is our Wilmington Cemetery. So with the cemetery being here, our barn being here, pretty much Pacific Coast Highway is right, eh, sort of in this area. 
So which makes for one of the stories that we've heard through residents that lived in Wilmington, that the old stable barn was actually torn down to make way for Pacific Coast Highway. And the other photographic evidence that we have is perhaps the middle barn, barn two, was the one that burned down because we do have pictures of an aftermath of a fire and there's a lot of debris on the ground. And the only real visible structure that we see from the angle is the large single story stable. So, this is one of the very early pictures that we have showing the very barn that we're in. Now, these wonderful people in the picture that's William and his younger stepsister, Lucy Banning, sitting in one of the carriages right outside. And of course, the famous JBB, so we know this is a Joseph photograph. So a couple of things to point out. So with Lucy being maybe six or seven there, so this is obviously, we're looking at about 1881, 82. So this perhaps was maybe an early visitation that we read about in Tom's sitting book with Phineas's older brother William that comes out to visit in the early 1880s. This may have been an occasion to bring the camera out and take wonderful pictures. But thank goodness Joseph did these things because here's a view of the barn that we never knew about. So what's missing obviously in this picture? The room that we're sitting in right now, the concourse. The concourse is gone. So what we have here is just the pediments that are today. We don't have a door because that's part of the concourse. So what you're actually looking at the end of the barn is right here. So what that means, everything came and went through the sides. The big doors on the sides. So when the horses came out, they went out through the sides. There were no vehicles in here at this time. It was just simply the main room here and the two hallways of stables. The upstairs was still here, of course, and seeing the beams right under the gables with the doors here, that was a hayloft. So that's a way for us to be able to use a Jackson fork and to be able to load up the hay because the hay baler hadn't been invented yet and everything was loose. So we're scooping hay up, we're pulling it up, and then we're unloading it up into the loft. And as we walk around, there are actually trap doors that are still in the floor up there to be able to open and then drop the hay down. So that's a lot of fun to be able to do, except for catching that thing. I can't imagine that was a lot of fun to do. So the other thing I want to point out, that's not our color today, is it? It's a little dark. It is a lot darker. Now, when we had our historic structures report, we talked about the house being the second phase of the painting, which was that golden brown with a dark brown trim. I don't think this house, the barns ever received the same color palette that the house did. And I think it was only until more recently when we go from transition from family to city that the barn is ever painted. The barn is always a very dark, dark red. So it is a red barn. And we have one door that's left here in the building on the second floor behind glass, which is a sliding door that still was never painted, thank gosh, because it, it still has that original color to it. Now, thanks to Joseph's writing on the negatives at number one, Barn Wilmington Place. So where we're at here, and I think Joe must have set the timer because that's him, this is our parking lot. So we're at the corner of the barn, which is right over here, showing two of the horses in there. But they're obviously using these doors, the side doors, to come and go out of that. Same barn. Now this is William in one of the vehicles that we have here. In fact, we have that vehicle in here which has been unrestored. It's still... So this is another great picture to be able to show you how they came and went out of the barn. 
the doors that are on the second floor to receive hay. And in the background, we've got the three pediments just like we have for this barn. Now this wonderful picture tells a thousand stories for us. Here's barn number two, which is almost identical to barn number one. Beyond barn number two was still a third structure. That's barn number three. This is the single elevation stable that runs from our parking lot all the way through the rose garden out that way. So we see that there. Back of the house is a wonderful, when we blow this up, there's so much detail about how the back of the house is configured. So with this, where will we be standing? I suspect we're probably across the street in the storage area. Because this is pretty far out. We can also see our windmill and our water storage. This is the tank. This predates the reservoir. And this, of course, being water up that high, they believed the gravity feed, the higher up it is, the more force you're going to have as it would flow you know, through force into the house. And there are a couple of dogs and dog houses here. This thing just goes on, the details of this. This is another negative from Joseph, and it's on a glass plate, and that's why the clarity of this is just unbelievable. So, these barns, these aren't here. These are Banding's barns downtown Wilmington. So I wanted to show you the similarity in his thinking. So not only does the barns on the property here have purpose, one being at one point a foundry, a stable, and then a bunkhouse, because he also housed employees here. The same configuration is almost used for the Wilmington, well this would, we're not sure if this is the Union Wagon Works or just Banning and Company's headquarters in, in, in Wilmington. But it's the same configuration with the two buildings joined together. Outside here, and I know this is hard to see, but he has what is generating his power in there, which is a steam, it's a boiler. So he's able to generate steam power through this little engine out here. And in the background, we've got brand new built wagons. So he is at one point during the 60s and early 70s still manufacturing stagecoaches and wagons and buggies as his newspaper ads claim that he's doing. This is also taken off of a stereo view. So this is just one half of it. Now, back to the house. Now, as we talked about on that survey in the very first slide, we've already reduced because barn number two is just down to one side. So they've either taken away two sections of that barn because we're still, we're not even as far out as that last picture. So they've done some reconfiguring with the barn setup. So I suspect this is probably closer to the date of the survey than it is that very that first picture that we just looked at. We can also see the single story stable is still in our parking lot area running out. We've got freight wagons here back in the holding area. And we also see several mules, two, two teams pulling a large wagon of loose hay, which is all going to be, of course, forked and then brought up into the loft. And we can still see, fortunately, barn number one is there. Now, this is the first picture we have, and this is probably, we think, circa 1890-ish, 91, 92, and this is obviously showing the extension being built onto our concourse onto barn number one. So, what we have here, what we think this is, is the trip to Yosemite. And this is the family's excursion going out. And in detail, when we look closely, we can really identify who most everybody is here. 
Another great aspect of this picture is this vehicle right here. This is what we call a mud wagon. Um, it's also a stagecoach, but it's given the slang term a mud wagon because these were the types of vehicles that did the heavy day-to-day, -day, not glorious travel, but the hard stuff on roads that were, were not very well maintained, if there was a road at all, they would send these out there. You would keep the really elegant, beautiful stagecoaches that we're used to seeing in the Wells Fargo commercials. These would be the ones that would be kept closer to town. So these wouldn't be the ones that you see out in the Overland travel days. They used the mud wagons. These were able to be opened air. Uh, the sidings were almost always canvas. You didn't have the enclosure. You could get more people in them. Um, but it's a great picture because probably this was made by Banning. Because we know through his inventories that he has mud wagons. He has stagecoaches. Um, and these are all listed in his inventories at the Huntington all throughout the 1860s. So fortunately, this vehicle survived and didn't go anywhere, and we still have we don't have it, but they still had it back then. They were able to use it on the trip. The door entrance has obviously changed. We can tell the door here is not our original door today. The library is not in there, the little room with the extension. So the configuration for that front part we're really not sure how that plays out. Um, not having, of course, a historic structure report, being able to go through the architectural evidence that of things that were here and things that were not here, have been able to identify, um, we don't know. It, it might be safe to say, because of having windows here and here, and this window is still here, this is in our, our bathroom area back there. Maybe they were offices. Maybe they were rooms. Maybe these were rooms that a stable hand would have been in. Somebody that could have been in the barn all the time because of having livestock in here. You kind of need an attendant. So these may have been those types of rooms. Well, when we talked about Andrew Young and his family being here, of course, after Phineas passes, the need to have all these barns and these structures here, really, they're not really doing what they were intended to do when the place was originally put together. So with the time of Joseph being here and Catherine, and then the young family, and then Hancock and Ann finally, the barns really aren't being utilized. And we're really not sure what role they played um, with the family at this point. Um, this is a great picture. It was taken by the Youngs, and it shows a couple of things. We still have the original paint scheme. We now have the library area has been added in. If we look at the bottom, the barn has been raised, and they've got a foundation now under the barn. So they've got footing under it. They've changed some of the doors, either because of raising the barn or issues of probably deterioration. Barn number two back here is just down to the one portion. And finally, barn number three is back there. And it looks like there's just one portion of that one also. Well, we think where this gentleman is sitting is the demise of barn number two. What we see in the background is that single layer stable that's running from here to here. So where he's sitting is probably over here outside our security fence on the grass area, looking this way. So when we blow this one up, this is also another one on a glass plate negative that was taken by Joseph. I don't know who he is. I can't identify him. The dog there looks very similar to the one that Joseph has in a lot of his pictures, and that dog's name was Jet, being Jet Black. So that looks like Jet. Who the gentleman is, 
I don't know. Um, but it's clear that there's machinery and other items that may have been inside barn number two after it burned that were just left there. So we've got burnt timbers, all kinds of debris back here, and it looks like it had taken out fencing. Now, possibly that other barn or that other structure that we see in that survey from the very first that we didn't know what it was, maybe this structure back here, which is just to handle hay. It could be. Here we have an Ann and Hancock banning era picture. Now, Ann and Hancock have already changed out the color scheme of the house. We're in our white. They've made the additions to the back. We have the moat down here, so this signals that we do have work that's happened underneath the house. We don't see a patio yet, but the moat is there, and we may be in a transitional period where they're working underneath, and they quite haven't gotten to excavating that other side yet. We do have our one-room schoolhouse with the siding here, and in the distance, we have our barns and still the red color. So this is telling us that Ann and Hancock, even though they've painted the house white to reflect that colonial revival look of the white with the green shutters, the barn, they're not really going to invest in the paint and to deal with it. It's just going to stay the barn. This is one of the first pictures we have of the barns being painted white. And the gentleman strolling towards you is William. This is the oldest son. And this is, I kind of get the feel of almost like a parting shot as he's kind of walking out. This is also taken with the family out front. This is that same time period. I suspect this was probably in the early 1930s when the house is really kind of being opened up for the first time by the, uh, the Daughters of the Golden West, uh, the Long Beach Parlor, because there are a series of photos that not only show family here, but have a great picture than we showed that last time of the patio down below in the fountain. So these were all kind of taken with the family still kind of visiting, but giving that kind of gesture of transition. So with William leaving, our barn pretty much has not changed since about the 1930s, physically. I mean, alteration-wise, there have been replacements of windows and doors. But for the most part, what we have here, we're very fortunate is still pretty much the same as it was as the family left it. Now for William, and oh, here's our pump house. So we know that was there in the 1930s. For William, he goes off to live in his, his ranch at Walnut, California. And this is his barn in Walnut, California. This isn't the house, this is the barn. And this really kind of shows Rom William's mindset, I think, is a good way to look at it. His love of that whole, those bygone days of using the stagecoach, of using the horse, the wagon, the carriage, the stagecoach to convey everything and everybody. And that's what he grows up understanding and living in. And I think the older he gets and starts reflecting on, on all of that, was probably what inspired the book Six Horses to be written when he wrote that with his nephew George Hugh Banning. So he starts, I think, almost in a, a very nostalgic mindset for him as, as he gets into his, his later years. So within this wonderful barn that he has, of course, is his carriage collection, his stagecoaches. And we don't have an actual physical written inventory, but we do have a photo inventory of what those vehicles look like and that were in his barn. And several of them do actually look like that mud wagon that we saw in the group photo outside the barn. William actually took it upon himself to customize what he thought those vehicles should look like. And he had a lot of the vehicles made uh, not only in California, but in Wilmington. And in fact, the last stagecoach that resembled that mud wagon that we saw was actually built in 1925 in Wilmington for one of 
William's friend, whose last name is Matheson, and had a, a ranch in Ventura. And that vehicle actually was built by Bill Muller's grandfather, and it's on display. And if you're ever near San Inez, there's the Parks Janeway carriage collection in San Inez that has one of the most beautiful carriage collections. They have a Banning stagecoach in there, plus that mud wagon. And if you ever have the opportunity to stop there, please do. It's, it's a great, great visit. Well, on, just to point out, here's the house. And it dwarfs in size to the barn. So for William, and when you're downstairs and you're looking at in our transportation gallery and you come across that very first monitor that shows William driving in that stagecoach, he's leaving to go on that run. So where he's located is in Walnut, and he's actually right next door to the Diamond Bar Ranch. And they were good friends, and apparently through the stories Mrs. Call has told me, William had permission to drive through the Diamond Bar Ranch whenever he wanted, and just to take the stagecoaches out, just let them go. And we've also got great stories from her and her cousins that talk about riding in that stagecoach and those wonderful days in the summer, of course, being in, in those, those coaches. Well, if you notice on top of his barn, it says the Overland Stagecoach Club. These are the other members of the Overland Stagecoach Club. Other members. <laughs> William was the only member, <laughs> except for his horses, of course. And this is how well he spoiled them. This is at the back side of that barn. Anything look familiar? Greek and revival. Greek revival. So did, he's brought his memory here of the home with him over there. So where I'm going to leave you today is with the barn pretty much the way friends took it over in the early 1970s. And as you can see, fortunately, our barn really hasn't changed very much. And as you know, through events and things that you've seen here, this barn really becomes almost a multi-purpose room. Not only do we have lectures, but we do fundraisers. Our school program is in here three days a week. Our general tours are in here five days out of the week. So this barn really gets a lot of use. And one of the things we are going to start looking at is an, a new kind of approach to how we interpret the inside of the barn and how we're going to make it uh, reflect a little bit better towards all the knowledge that we've gained about this um, over the years. Of course, the barn is almost one of the, the best and the fun tools that we have with our school program, of course. If I've got a group of kids I like to play the identification game out there just to get their minds connected with what these vehicles were used for back then and how similar they are to the vehicles that we have today. And so they can all relate to when you ask them, okay, what's missing from these? And what makes them go? And they go, horses. What replaced the horse? The engine. And so they start understanding, okay, well, this really hasn't changed very much, except for we've actually taken the horse away, put an engine on it, put a side on it, put doors on it, put a steering wheel on it, and a gas and a brake, and then off we go. So they really haven't changed that much. And so I ask them, which one do you guys think is like the pickup truck? And then they all look, and they get into it, and then they go, oh, the red one. Yeah, very much so. That is like a pickup truck. Well, which one's like an SUV? And they look and they go, the yellow one. Well, that's right, because it's up high. It's got bigger wheels to, to accommodate a rougher terrain. And it's also got a suspension that's very strong. It's actually on leather. And if you notice, our red one here is also on leather. And it's exactly the way the stagecoaches were made, which is called a thorough brace. So this thorough brace, this leather strap, in fact, there's about five of them on here, actually allow the vehicle to go back and forth like this. And so the neat thing about that is, if you've got six horses or four horses ahead of you, 
And it's easier to do what that way? Your momentum from a start. Because once they pull, it's going to rock. And that rocking is going to move the momentum towards them. So they're able to do that. As with these, the suspension's on the side and then the green one, but they're metal. So that's not going to take a lot of power to move those. Which one's like the sports car? Well, it's like the red one, the ladies' runabout. They call this a ladies' runabout because it has a wider distance between, this is still called a dash, believe it or not, to the seat for a skirt, be able to get the skirt in there. We also have what's called a pony cart, which would have been something perfect if you were more of an influential family being able to have a smaller vehicle so your kids could learn how to drive. And then finally we ask them, which one do you think is like the limousine? And they all point to that one. And then we ask them why. And they think about it for a minute and they go, because you had a driver. That's the only vehicle we have here that you don't drive. Someone else is driving you. And so when you get in the limousine, it is like a limousine. It's very plush in here. And it even has the ability to talk to the driver. Slow down. <laughs> Pull over. I need something. So it's got all these wonderful ability to do that. So with that, is there anything special about the Brome besides being able to be shuttled around in luxury that you've noticed? The doors, lanterns, yes. Rubber tires. That's made for downtown. So you would never take that out on a country dirt road because you would chew those off quickly. So that tells us whoever owned this had money didn't drive around town in steel rims, but was able to actually have a little bit more smoother ride that went over cobblestone or brick pavers, which downtown Los Angeles had for many, many years before they started paving. It is a jaunting cart, but that's for a single horse, and the jaunting cart allowed you to kind of have a leisurely outing. This obviously wasn't anything used for work or anything along those lines, but it's, it's fun. Now, the room next to us is actually very new. This room and our, our all-encompassing repair shop back there was made for our school program. And this was something we wanted to be able to do to show the school kids when they came here what a stable hand might have to do. And it was the whole under the idea of having a young person that's finished their primary grades they are actually looking for a vocation, a place to come and learn their skill, whether that be a carpenter, a wheelwright, a farrier, a blacksmith. All of those trades would have been something that would have been achievable here. In return for learning that skill and that vocation, you were given room and board, and, but most importantly, you were on hand stable hand, you were on hand to be able to take care of the horses, the vehicles, everything that came and went out of this barn, it was something that you were responsible for. You were responsible for the feeding, the care of the stock, making sure the vehicles that came back were in good running order. If there was a problem, identify it and let the right people know. So it was a very important job. And after that apprenticeship was over and they were skilled enough to be able to take that and go on their own, of course they would replace it, but it's almost kind of like a trade school. And you weren't really paid, we don't really know what the pay structure was like, besides a free room and board, you got your education. Now looking at a couple of those photographs that we saw with the barn, could those rooms over here with the windows have been that? Very possibly could have been, but that's something we're not gonna know. So. With our stable hands room, our stalls, but these stalls were just referred to as an open end stall. And so each horse that had their stall pretty much was assigned to this one, if you think about it. All the tack that is on the hook here is all adjustable. 
And so it's very important that that horse, and all horses are different shapes and sizes, you put that horse back with his set attack because in the morning when you go to do, take your animal out and hook him up, you don't want to spend time readjusting because he's got the wrong set of clothes with him. So it was important to put him back inside the stall. At some point there was a, another chain just like the ones that we have out there that held him in. And here he could have had his salt. The bin in here is for his hay, his feed. To clean it out, you take it out from underneath. The boards here at the bottom aren't original. It probably was all dirt. However, they were here when horses were here because we've had to cut a few of them out over the years. And it's apparent that horses did live in there because <laughs> of the intensity of that. These open end stalls went all the way down, and then on the sides over here we have one, two, and three, which are box stalls. And so a box stall would have been something you would have kept a stallion in, um, a room kind of with more privacy, and they also have feeding um, holders on the corners in these rooms. Um, it was just a way to keep an, iso an animal isolated. It's a fly net. So this goes on the back of a horse, and so when he's out, you know, the tail can only do so much. So with this on, all he has to do is do this, and these whip around, and they keep the flies off you. Yeah, they are getting harder and harder to find. The final portion of this we're going to show you is our repair shop. The room today we really interpret as a repair kind of area. This by no means would represent the size of the foundry that they would have needed, but we do want to include this to show the kids, especially about repairing things and getting the notion into their head that you really, you wore it out before you threw it out. This, you know, there's no Pep Boys or Home Depot to run to after something breaks. You had it, you had to fix it, and having that ability to not only make wheels and tires, but to be able to repair things in a carpentry environment, a metal environment, things that needed to be forged and, and re-put back together or, or created. All of that could happen here. And all of that, of course, was one, hopefully the responsibility of that stable hand that realized if one of the vehicles came back, there was a problem. And he could let the wheelwright know that there's, you know, a spoke has happened, the wheel has is, is become warped or loose. He could also tell the farrier that uh, some of the mules that came back today have lost shoes. The farrier then could actually either make them or, or replace them and put those back on. So the idea with this, with our school program especially, is to get that sense of, of resourcefulness and how this as a property, when it was in its heyday, really kind of took care of itself. The operations came and went right here. You know, everything happened here. And then they're going to ask you, well, what's those tools with it? Just don't worry about it. Yes, see. If they point in that direction, it's, it's a carpentry tool. If they point over here, well, that's for blacksmithing. <laughs> so with that, thank you very much. And if you have any questions or think of something later, let me know. My door is always open. And I look forward to hearing you on tour through my, my office door and go, yes. She, she, they, they nailed it.